Um, welcome to um, our second art forum for this week. Um, I just before I introduce um, Scott today, just want to announce an extra event at six o'clock up here. Uh, another glass artist will be speaking, Jiong Li, who is currently um, a visiting artist at the Glassworks. So it's a fantastic glass fest today in the lecture theatre. I hardly really feel like I need to introduce Scott, apart from the fact that he is a distinguished alumnus of our glass workshop. He has a, had a stellar career, international career as a glass artist. He's one of a coterie of very distinguished graduates from our, art, um, our glass workshop who've gone on to have very significant um, international careers. Um, and he has, since his graduation, spent quite a lot of time coming back home mm -hmm. <laughs> to do residencies and to run workshops here. So it just feels really like, you know, um, you haven't gone away really, Scott. <laughs> um, but for those of you who are not familiar with Scott and his work, apart from being an internationally fabulous glass artist, he's also done a lot of very interesting pioneering work on um, painting, um, enamel painting on glass. And he has recently done quite a lot of work, um, working overseas. You've been resident in Berlin, that's right, isn't it? Uh, and working also in um, other uh, countries close to um, Germany. Uh, his work is housed in, uh, has been collected by major um, international collections. The Museum of Contemporary Glass in Germany is one such museum and the Musée de Verre in France. Um, and as I said, for seven years he's worked uh, in Europe, in Great Britain and also been resident in Berlin for some time. Uh, and we're lucky enough to have him uh, working as an artist in residence in the glass workshop at the moment. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome you home, Scott, and thank you very much for agreeing to be part of the Art Forum program. Waratah, look. Okay. I was going to apologise for a technical issue and that wasn't going to be turning around and I was going to get everyone else to stand up and turn around to get the feel of it. But um, I'll go ahead and thank you very much, Anne. And um, I'd also like to thank Waratah for assisting me this afternoon <laughs> getting this going. It is home to me, Canberra. Um, I've never lived in one place longer than four years in one stint, but I keep on coming back to Canberra. It's a place where all my friends are and I value that a lot. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, all the staff from uh, the Canberra Glass, uh, Canberra School of Art Glass Department workshop. Um, Richard, Nadej, Mel, Phil, and uh, also all the students for putting up for the new guy in their space. I'm going to be basing my talk on the circle. Uh, the circle to me, and probably uh, as, you, as you would all know, is such a primal symbol that crosses many different cultures. It has been something that I've worked with for, very, uh, for a very long time. It can be mean, it can be aggressive, and it can be kind of like biting at times where I've fought against it. Now when I say that, I'm not actually fighting against the form of the circle, but my own work, and uh, where it gets carried away. Uh, taken away from me through um, other opportunities. I've been very fortunate, as Anne said, that I've made a career that got me no uh, noticed overseas. I was able to show in museums. I was traveling over to America twice a year. I had um, a major, well, I still have a good gallery in New York, but the first show that I had there, the solo show, was enough to come back and buy a house in Canberra, Queanbeyan, sorry, Queanbeyan, <laughs> Queanbeyan. and uh, you know, I was, I was doing fantastic, uh, but it seemed to be at that time that I got swept up with this kind of whole commerce and the glass wave. Everyone was going crazy, we were getting busloads of American collectors coming out to our studio in Pialago that would fight to get into the door and then just point, I want that one. And there seemed to be a lack of integrity behind their collecting. They just needed to have a piece. And it was this fight, this battle that I had. Do I, do I just ride this wave or do I continue making? The vessel 
was actually a working at that time a metaphor for the, for the body. I was doing these paintings on the outside which related to per, uh, public interpretations. Paintings on the inside of the vis, uh, vessel which were different and that related to a more uh, private, personal reading. I then started to work with these when I first went to England on a, a Leverhulme Research Fellowship and I, I thought, okay, I'm going to take the vessel away, continue with the object of the paintings and also the mosaics, but make them solid. These are about 50 centimetres tall and about 50 kilos of weight. They were fused, painted and poured from the furnace, a hot cast pouring into a mold, uh, sand cast mould. As while I was pouring it, I was throwing in marinis. The marinis had numbers and it was called rolling the dice. So I saw this as a bit of a gamble, kind of taking this new direction. It got readily accepted and it did well, but again, I still felt that it wasn't biting uh, like a lot of the work did before. I made, them, I made these crystal pieces and uh, I made these in the Czech Republic and had them all polishing them up. I really love technique and as banal as it sounds, I get a big buzz at looking at paperweights. And it's just that intriguing interior, how do they do it? And as, as you become more experienced in glass technology or skill, you actually look and find deeper, uh, deeper techniques and tricks that people have used to put into these little ca uh, capsules of glass. Here I've used a lot of Venetian techniques, uh, twisting the canes, but then I've taken them back, infused them, made big slabs and then dived into the kiln whilst hot and rolled it up. These pieces got up to about a metre tall, depending on the size of the kiln that I could lay them down. It was, it was again, it was kind of like all I was doing was really having a kind of like a technical buzz. I wasn't really making something that made me feel I was making a statement. I'm a big art junkie. I love going to museums. I love looking at sculpture and painting. And when I look at these, I say, hey, beautiful decorative pieces and nice technical standing. But for me, I just don't think they could carry all the emotions or all the ideas that I wanted to portray into these pieces. I was starting, I knew I was heading off to Germany soon and I started creating these other vessels which were quite a large amphoras and they were based on um, the German flag which I saw as a reference to the Aboriginal flag, yellow, black, red. And so I started making these pieces with overlays of colour and then sandblasting through them with a narrative, trying to think of the different cultures that, were, uh, that I was traversing between. This came back at me when I saw this one day on the website. You'll see here it's a, a Fun Trivia and Weird Al Yankovic and the first palindromic. I actually made palindromes for the names of the pieces and they've actually titled me in there. I am regal and the, the continuing part, a German am I. And then it goes down, an artist named Scott Chasling designed a vase after this palindrome. Scott Jacobson Gallery described it. Now this is my gallery in New York. And they're describing it as going like yellow, red, and brown. So <laughs> I'm sorry, brown is not the new black. I looked, I found this on the website, and I said, I need to get out of this kind of cycle. I need to get out of this. So I thought the best way to deal with it was circle your wagons, bring your friends around, bring them close, and kind of build a little grouping. I was losing this when I was in England, but when I got to Germany, I was very fortunate to have an old school friend that I used to go surfing with in my high school days and he'd been living in Berlin for close on 25 years. He told me about, he told me about this place. Now, um, there's the mouse. This area, this is still what they call a park house, a parking station. It's still used for car parking. But uh, there was a group of five, six of us and we approached the, um, the landlord and said how many car parks are in this area. And now I'm talking about this, these three bays here, which is also on the back down there too, around the back. And he said there was this many car parks and we said, right, we'll take them all. We took them all and we built walls and we made our studios in there. And this is very German, you can get away with this. Uh, even up here, uh, this is a little chimney where I had a, an illegal wood oven to heat the place. Um, we, right from the onset, we said that this was going to be not just our studios, 
but it was also going to be a project space. And uh, I was pushing hard for this. I wanted to, uh, there's a lot of artist run spaces in there. Now, if you read it, it's, uh, it was a, an offices of the DDR uh, Park House, and it's still used at four cars. And we got in there and started doing Friday night exhibitions. Only one night, uh, an exhibition, and we would use the void in the middle of the car ramp and have exhibitions there. Now, you can see here, uh, that's my studio on the end here. I've projected the, the European sign for a parking station, the little P with a roof over the head. This is a, a, one, a copy of one of the invitations for the show, or one of the shows we had, Redux Deluxe. And uh, you, you might recognize a few of the names up there. We've got Guy Benefield, who now lives in uh, New York, but he's uh, originally from Melbourne, a performance painter. Um, who else? Um, Katarina Grosser, uh, if you know your paintings, your large installation uh, paintings, Katarina Grosser. Klaus Weber, I talked to the glass people last week. He's, um, he had a big uh, crystal fountain that was flowing with diluted LSD, called the LSD fountain. And uh, yeah, it went down in the glass. He's also might know Stephen Paul Day from New Orleans. This was my friend, uh, Lucio Ori, the guy that's been living in uh, Berlin for a long time. We've co-curated the show. Now this is here, you see the architecture, it's gorgeous. I just, you know, we had people just coming in and just saying, I want to show here. This is at the bottom of the ramp, the platform down here. This is Sven Weigel, and it's called Requiem for an Interview. He's just got a live feed going onto a Mies van der Rohe Barcelona chair and then live feeding back into the, um, the television. It was a very quiet piece, but it was, it was a very nice thing. We always had, this was filmed, pho sorry, photographed in the daytime, though at night it was just, you know, it just sang. It was just so quiet, and then everyone would walk up and around the platform up to the studios, to the gallery space. Being quite <laughs> high, 30 metres high, we were also put sky hooks up and uh, it was suspended pieces. These are large uh, inflations from Anna Maiga Carson. And some of you might know the name Michael Kuchbar, uh, Adelaide artist, uh, who also lives, has been living in Berlin for a number of years. This is a large video piece that he had. We were able to kind of control the lights uh, in the space. Uh, the only problem is, as it is still a car park, cars would enter and then they had to, they, they'd just hit this button and the lights would come on and everyone would have to stand to the side. Because you can see, you know, here we are standing around, there was drinks flowing and people talking, next minute a car is staring up, tearing up the ramp. Uh, the first show was called Big Bang Beautiful. And that was really, there wasn't any kind of real thematic curation to that show. It was very loose rather than let's make it big and let's make it loud and try to get some people coming in, having a look at our new space. It worked. We had every opening we had on a Friday night, and everyone knew that it started about 7 o'clock, but I can tell you they all came after all the other openings closed and would come to us. Uh, we had an illegal bar set up there. We were just selling $2 beers over in the corner. People would stay on. We even had people arriving at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, it just went on. It was a great time, a really nice experience. And people put so much energy in for one night exhibitions. Now, going by the title of this exhibition, yes, it's my curation, Circle Works. Uh, this is uh, Lucio Ori Flor uh, from Australia, uh, Florian Neufeld, and in the front there is Tim Greaves from England. And when I say people put work in, this is another piece for the same exhibition as a video from Michael Kuchbar. He worked for two weeks doing a charcoal and chalk drawing down the white wall there. Again, it was just for the one night. Here we had uh, an exhibition called Ramp, Rampa, and uh, this was all, uh, again, we, we really wanted to call it the Berlin Guggenheim, although that's already taken, unfortunately. Uh, but the idea of walking around that void where we could suspend and have pieces down the bottom, but also exhibit all around the walls was a fantastic opportunity. 
Uh, this was an exhibition put, put forward by a, a couple of um, German artists. Uh, they wanted to do a non-objective painting <laughs> exhibition. And uh, this, is, this large piece here is by Giles Ryder, Queensland slash Sydney-based painter. We also had, um, I suppose, an informal artist in residence. This is from Tuft Green, and he's a Los Angeles artist. Uh, he came over, and these are worked on a kind of cartography of uh, the building itself and the streets around the studio. Uh, it was great to have him in, just a pa the, the power and the kind of energy that he put forward in his work, constantly working to put that show together. What's the material space? Cardboard. All cardboard. Okay. To come a full circle. Got to apologise for that icon. <laughs> um, I, Googled, <laughs> I Googled images, a lot of these icons, and uh, I, I, wanted, I Googled um, full circle, and that was the first thing that came up, and I said, that got to take guts to put that up there. Um, there's a nice pluralistic uh, reading of that image, though. You know, like, boys to men, there's a maturity coming to the work, or is it that kind of fine edge between crazy or courage to wear plaid pants? <laughs> Um, my work has come a full circle. Uh, the, what I was doing before this fusing and this painting uh, was a lot of large sculpture, uh, mixed media, and it just happened that I got uh, involved. And I was very happy, I'm don't, not denying it, I had a great time with all the fusing and painting, though I seem like I have come a full circle. This was, I think it's around 1992, there was the, uh, Berm, the conference, uh, Osglass conference in Canberra. And this is down at the drill hall. And uh, this is a piece that I put in. And the lovely judge at the time, Neil Roberts, chose it as a winning piece. Um, it's a collection of drawings, photographs, and uh, solid work glass. Now, if anyone was around here in early 1991, uh, my postgraduate diploma was based on that solid glass ring upon stands, but I had a lot of breakages. And so what I've done here is made that break explode and hold it in a frozen moment. It sits upon a burnt plinth. After that, um, I did a year's teaching with Richard up in Sydney, and then I was very, and I think the date is wrong on that. It should be a couple of, or one year earlier. Uh, and then from Sydney, I went. I was very fortunate. I went to Wheaton Village, which is a, a glass factory over in New Jersey, and th I was there for three months, and followed that up by the Power residency in the Cité Studios in Paris. So it was an amazing year of just making. Whilst in Wheaton Village, they have a museum there and a lot of historical glass, and they were they presented these old chains, glass chains, fully interlocking. And I had never seen this before and I had no idea how it was made. And I love this idea of linking the circles together, this fragile material, and yet this kind of representing such a strong uh, form. I asked everyone, the, the librarians, the curators, and also all, all the glass people around, how do you make these glass chains? And uh, no one had an idea. So it was on the back of my mind and I was doing my work and then I always thinking about it. And then one night I had this idea of how I could knit these together. And we had 24 hour access in there and I just worked all night and then the other three residents came in and there was these, you know, just hanging, a jungle of these chains hanging from the ceiling. So I took a couple of strength, lengths of those over to Paris with me and I was in Paris studio for six months and uh, I, presented these works. Now, in Paris, I wanted to continue making the glass chains, but of course there was no hot glass studio. You walk into the Cité studios, it's a bare room. I think there might have been an easel there. And uh, I thought, okay, how am I going to make chains? How am I going to make my rings? What am I going to do? It's using, again, referencing history, which I think is so important to do, and techniques from industry. I thought of cutting bottles up. Now, on, uh, you saw the bottle at the beginning turning around on a record player. This is just a low-tech version of what they do in industry to cut 
the tops of most of your glasses that you drink out of. If you ever feel around, sometimes around the lip of a cheap beer glass or a wine glass, you might feel a little lump in the lip. And that's where they've scratched it, put a score now. That bottle at the beginning had all these score lines down it. And it's the same thing. You score around it. As it rotates, you put a flame onto it, and the crack forms and runs around. And that little bump is just where it's off-centered a little bit. But then they fuse it in afterwards. They just hot, hot flame it and uh, fire polish it down. So I got record, uh, went to a flea market in Paris, got the record player, and then asked all the other international artists, there's 250 studios there in the Cité, um, just drop some bottles, empty bottles at my front door. Now, <laughs> opening up the door in the first couple of mornings, there was just mountains of empty bottles there, all these artists drinking red wine. So I just sat around soaking the labels and uh, cutting bottles for uh, about two months and then found out that if you score down the side, there's enough flex in glass to stretch over and connect to make a link. And so I made all the, all the green bottles on the right, right, you can see that they've linked together like that. On the left was another project I did whilst traversing Europe. Uh, was, uh, it's a piece called Stolen Wishes. The top row is Manila, uh, swing tags on glass with coins. And then the second row and the fourth row is actually vinyl letters pressed into white silicon that says stolen wishes. <coughs> the coins were all taken out of wishing wells and fountains from around Europe. And so I just tagged them on the little manila. So I was taking or reclaiming people's wishes. I know, evil stuff, evil <laughs> stuff. And it just happened whilst I was over there. I was reading the kind of like, what was it, Herald Tribune or something, the English paper in Europe. Some guy in... Um, um, in Rome, uh, he got caught going into the fountain and scooping out all these coins. Went to court and the judge says, well, look, it's open property. It's out in the open. You just, it belongs to everyone. So, I, you know, I, I was okay after that. I felt like I didn't have to hide it too much. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use these. These are just 2D images taken from 3D modeling that I do. Uh, I use uh, just simple... Um, SketchUp program to model a lot of my work now and uh, I just take these 2D images and uh, they'll be used in this talk as kind of intervals. Okay, so then uh, from England and uh, just before I really settled in Berlin I had another residency. Now this is why I'm saying a full circle. Here's a gap of about 12 years and what I've done here is uh, they've, in France three months at the hot glass studio. I had a studio all to myself. So I thought, what am I going to do? They didn't have all the colourful glass that I usually work with. They only had the furnace of clear glass. So I thought, okay, I'm going to start making chains again. I decided to make the chains. Now, if, uh, my vessels and my, all my paintings are kind of self-referential. They talk about political, kind of social kind of effects, but more what they, how they affect me. When I'm reading a newspaper, I might flick past global war and turn to kind of like some kind of lost dog event, you know, and a very banal, but it was kind of like just trying to absorb things and how I put those into the reading of my works. So I see my, all my work as, uh, as definitely referencing myself, my travels. So what I'm doing here is making chains my height. I do just constantly kind of knit these chains to my height and I didn't even know what they were going to be doing, you know, what I was going to do with them. I had no idea why. For three months, well pretty much two and a half months, I was making these and then finally I, I went in. The exhibition that was in the museum uh, where I was going to have a show had been pulled down and I got to see the space. And the space is about as big as this room but it used to be two rooms. They'd taken out the dividing wall. There's a grand old fireplace with a gilt mirror. Grand old fireplace with a gilt mirror down there. There was a door there, a door there, a rosette, which used to carry a chandelier, and a rosette also over there. So it was actually a reflection. It was a mirror of itself. And that kind of intrigued me. I love the idea of uh, this architecture. And rather than making just pieces that were installed into the show, I actually wanted to make an installation something that referenced and uh, depended upon the architecture. So that's what I did. Uh, it, it doesn't actually show too well because of the way perspective changes here. But it's actually uh, 
48 chains right down the middle there, and then it breaks off 24 each way, which then join and makes uh, 14, joining makes 7, and then drop up. And they went up. Now, this is not in situ of the exhibition. This was set up just purely for the photograph. Uh, but uh, it would go up to the rosettes and then drop down into these buckets. The reason I made this piece, not only that it reflected, I was actually looking upon the reflection of my time there and coming from Australia. I came from Australia when it was heavily in drought. I went to France where it was in springtime. It had been snowing. There was icicles everywhere. Water was dripping. Everyone was just kind of like pushing water away. And I felt, I kind of felt funny about that. You know, you come from that history of the drought and then you go in there and it's just a troublesome thing. This was before we had the floods. And, uh, and then I thought, you know, here we are, you know, these two kind of parallels, you know, this, these sins of kind of getting rid of this, but also then this idea of water too as a cleansing thing. There were a lot of churches around in the town there that I was looking at, and I was looking at the fonts, you know, and all the people that blow glass, or maybe even in ceramics, you know, these beautiful half-shaped, half half-spherical bowls, you know, the beautiful forms that they would use for baptismal fonts. Now, I looked at those and I was looking at also this kind of uh, waste of water and I was looking at So I was thinking of narcissists looking into the water, that sin, but also the purging of the sins by have it being baptised. So those kind of things started to bounce around with the water. What I did here, I kind of like, for me, I kind of classified these domesticated water pails as my, my little font, my personal font. Okay, so I made this piece, this was the last piece I made. Now this was a massive glass sphere and uh, again it's using, really exaggerating that idea of uh, the fragility of the material but the oppression and heaviness of the form. And uh, I really liked it. It wasn't really about um, that so much and it wasn't really about the crystal ball kind of like trying to foresee the future path that I might have over creative work or anything, but it was really just this kind of, I don't know, it was kind of felt free. It's called freedom. I, I felt unshackled by this, all these kind of old glass techniques and the colours. I got back to a pure state. And I, fortunately, I wasn't the only one that read that. This was probably one of my proudest moments with all the exhibitions and everything. This was in um, a full page ad from the northern state of France. And they put it uh, into, in Geo magazine, the National uh, Geographic magazine of France, for their support to the freedom of the press. Okay, and again, similar to going from Wheaton Village to Paris, where they had no fur uh, furnace, I went from France to Berlin, where there was no furnace. So I thought, right, back to the beer, but wine bottles. And again, you can see really the brown bottles going into the green, going down the clear bottles. I didn't link them this time. I tied them with cable ties. And I was able to build a lot more of a, a very strong structure. This is called Mother and Child. Uh, like everything else, it kind of goes back. Either it's a painting or it's a form that relates back to the figure. Uh, at this time I was looking at Henry Moore's sculptures and there's a beautiful, very large marble sculpture, I think the, named as many of his are, it's called Reclining Figure. Um, but it just had these beautiful kind of, the arm coming out and dropping down as, as the lady laid back. And it was just this, uh, this structure, this right angle of the shoulder and the arm that really came to me. Uh, it's called Mother and Child because it, uh, Obi is... Uh, Germany's um, Bunnings, it's a hardware, and uh, that was where I was getting all my materials from, so I saw this as my nutrient, my breast, kind of thing of the mother, and the, bo uh, the ball down there just being me, the child. Uh, this is called Choke, uh, it's about one and a half metres high, so this was using uh, blue Prosecco bottles, that I cut up and there's a pink pl plastic ball just in there. It's very literal, this piece. Uh, I was just doing uh, kind of interior drawings of the body and that and just choking, constriction. What was, uh, what was interesting though was 
in Germany, they have a very good recycling system where you get a fund or a deposit on your Coca-Cola bottles, your beer bottles, your plastic bottles, but there's no return on wine bottles. And yet they have all these big kind of recycling bins everywhere. And uh, you have the bottle collectors, the old guys walking around with their sacks and their bags collecting all their bottles to get their money for, for food, drink, whatever. And here's me walking around with an old bicycle trailer <coughs> full of wine bottles. And they're, you know, was Max du, man? You know, like, what are you doing? There's no money on those things. Oh, uh, yeah, you go. Okay. I'm an artist. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Again, uh, relate, this is called, um, this is called uh, rib cage. Uh, so this is uh, plywood bent around here. The glass and the uh, the red is actually swimming noodles. And mention the European Museum of Modern Glass. Uh, this is in Bavaria, and I was very <laughs> fortunate to be asked to have a show there. Uh, it's, a, it's got some amazing work in there, and what I saw there was uh, all the glasses, know the Czech artists, uh, Lubinsky and Bridgekova. Uh, it's a, they're an amazing duo, uh, couple, and uh, for many years have been making, lar well, were making large-scale cast work. Uh, in the museum was this little sphere, and it's called Cube Within a Sphere. And I just saw that and I fell in love with it and I wanted to interpret it in my own way. This is called Blue Eyes. Uh, this is two meters across <coughs> and uh, it uses 8,000 cable ties. That's the mold. That's a paper mache mold and I'm, you can see there the rings with the cable ties attached to it before I snip them all back. That's in my studio and going by the jacket it was one of those very cold winters. Uh, museums in Berlin, the Museum Island or Insel, uh, is amazing. The old, the new, the uh, Pergamon, the well, Bock. <coughs> this, this is uh, the Pergamon Museum, which is uh, the second largest museum of Islamic art in the world. And I believe they're going to be doing an extension which will make it the largest museum of Islamic art. Uh, the curator saw some of my work and just loved the repetition of the circles. Um, and how it kind of referenced Islamic mosaics, asked me if I've ever been to an Islamic country, and I said no, but I live in Kreuzberg, which is uh, full of uh, Turkish Muslims, and uh, so I, she, uh, that didn't pass, so I ended up going to um, Istanbul for a weekend, just so she could show my work. Um, they actually acquired this piece. This is, uh, they loved it how it sat against the uh, back wall. This is the Mashata wall uh, and all the deep carving and piercing. Um, it wasn't a big palace, it was really what we, I suppose we'd call a homestead, but that was a retaining wall on the outside and they've taken it brick by brick, slab by slab to it. So then I came back last year. Last year? Last year. Uh, early last year. And, uh, and I was in contact with Mark Van Veen, who was at the time at uh, CMAG, and talked about putting a show on. So this was last year around, I think it was around June, July, May, June last year. I, uh, they had already painted all of these walls and floor black, and I said, let's keep it, let's go with it because I was going to bring in some lights and there was a lot of clear glass, so I thought against the black it would look well. It was horrible to photograph, as you'll see, but uh, it was called Deluge. Now, this was after the floods. Now, I was also thinking of um, other ways, of kind of like the, uh, not only the kind of inundation of houses and that, but also oneself. My return back here was under kind of like a bit of strain and stress, so I was thinking of those kind of like, okay, flooded with emotions and everything like that. This is the work. And I kind of purged onto this piece. 
Um, you know, I suppose there's those kind of like uh, five stages of grief that you go through in, in emotional times. And uh, this is what I was doing and how that related to all the people that were flooding and losing their houses and everything too. Hey, this is a faux lead light. It's actually plastic with vinyl, vinyl uh, adhesives and a bit of black silicon for lead. Uh, but I, you know, I think the importance, again, and I'll reiterate it, is the uh, referencing of history and, uh, and techniques. You know, if I didn't know how to make a lead light, I don't think I would know how to do that. I was also, you can see over there, the kind of darker blue diamond there. And if you look at lead light windows in churches, to repair, they'll, you know, if someone's thrown a stone through, they'll repair it, but they don't always have the same colour. So sometimes you're looking up at these churches, and you'll notice that one is off colour. And that's what I was doing. It's just making those little hints and references. This is uh, kind of like the reconstruction, I suppose. Uh, the way it kind of looks like scaffolding and uh, having the high-vis fluoro top at the back there and the use of the mirrors to kind of like double the size of the piece. And then later on that year, uh, I, it wasn't really called a residency, it was called P times 3 Project, and this was at the Glassworks. And I got uh, to work with Nick Folland, a sculptor from, Adel from Adelaide. And uh, whilst there, of course, I hit the, hit the turntables and made some more rings. Uh, I made these, la these three pieces. And these had mirrors that sat inside of them on about a 45 degree angle. Your, my intent was that the viewer actually stepped over the tubes with the kind of little safety cones in it and stood inside. This was called comfort. So, uh, you know, looking upon your, your reflection, be, being comforted by this kind of like bandage going around you of glass. I'm not a purist, I'll say that. I love technique and everything, and I love admiring other people's skills of uh, working with it. But I believe in the material being, uh, being uh, following the idea. Here, this, I just wanted a big fat wad of blue. And the best thing I could find was fish filters, aquarium filters. This was a piece that I showed, uh, made during that project, and it was shown up in uh, Annandale Galleries in, a, in an exhibition called Man in Sydney in, uh, called Manifold. And it was uh, about uh, contemporary abstraction. Uh, I don't know, I actually find I don't really consider my work being anywhere near abstract at all. Uh, this was made to my height, it's, it's referencing me again, and uh, God, if only I could be that thin. Um, but it's, it's all about, it, I kind of like saw myself within that piece, and I, even though other people might walk in and just say it looks like a lollipop, for me it's not abstract at all. <coughs> okay, coming to the end, precious. The perfect circle, uh, because of my travels, and I constantly on the move, this, living this nomadic life. I actually, a lot of the time, I think about how one creates when you're nomadic, as compared to one who is in a stasis. The idea of absorbing information. If you live within the same city or town all, all the time, the information you have is familiar. So maybe you're absorbing through books or through television, but it becomes a very close and personal. Whilst those who are nomadic, I'm always got my eyes open and I'm looking. Now, an example of this is my um, former partner. She would always walk with her eyes down. She had lived in Germany all of her life and always walk with her eyes down. And she was thinking a lot more whilst I would walk around like that, uh, open and looking. And we actually, a couple of times, we'd say, okay, let's, let's reverse it. You look down, you look up. And it was a, such a struggle. Both of us fought against this. You know, we were kind of, I'd end up going like, oh, did you see that house over there? She goes, no, but I saw the stones kind of thing. So it was an interesting way of uh, reading the world. And, um, and I still like that, how people create 
if you have your studio and you're able to go down to the caf uh, the milk bar and you know the person says oh how this, how's it going Scott compared to forever going into that a new milk bar and people saying oh you're a stranger around here so how do I how do I then kind of like have time off away from my art I live my art every time every day I'm just I don't I, I've been very fortunate I've been pretty much my whole career has been just being an artist um, and uh, what do I do in my time off? I walk. But I don't walk around the block. I'm not a person who wakes up every morning and says, I've got to do a kind of walk around down to the deli or something. This is one of my favorite walks. This is the Camino de Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. And it's a 900 year old pilgrimage. Uh, Yes, it's Catholic pilgrimage. No, I'm not Catholic. Uh, uh, but I do find that idea of just throwing the pack on. And now I know this walk. I know I can catch a train there, land in St. jean peter Paul, which is right on the French side just here of the Pyrenees. You can arrive there. There's a little hostel. You have your backpack, and then the next day you walk. And uh, it's right across over to Santiago there, which is 800 kilometers. And if you feel up to it, you do another 100 kilometers to Finisterre on the coastline to burn your clothes. Um, I, would, I would do it tomorrow. Uh, the only issue I have with it now is that it's becoming more and more popular every year. The last time I walked it was in November, which is just going on to the European winter. The first day over the Pyrenees was snow, and pretty much every day for four weeks after that, was rain and I couldn't think of anything better it was just such a cleansing uh, and yeah it's a beautiful thing to do so I tried to do it when I came well I, my version of a pilgrimage is when I came back to Australia was in September last year uh, I jumped on a kayak and went from the Cor from Corion over there to the Murray mouth Two and a half thousand kilometers and I'd never been on a kayak before. Was there any water to be in the kayak or on the boat? Lake Malwala, Yarrawonga, it was full, it was flowing. Uh, I almost died the first day in the rapids. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was an adventure, it really was an adventure. Uh, you know, of course I've done a lot of camping and everything so I know once I got onto the, onto the uh, uh, the banks, I was fine, but you know, the first few days I hadn't really had a lot of uh, practice, a couple of kilometres in Port Phillip Bay and then back, but um, I got up to doing, I think, uh, <coughs> 80 kilometres a day, and uh, you know, it was, when you have scenery like this, you know, you can't find that, it was beautiful. I went through some amazing places, uh, it became that fine edge between meditation and fucking boring, but uh, <laughs> I, again, I would do it again. Uh, uh, you know, it's beautiful. I, uh, the, the rapids kill, could have killed me. The trees falling around in a mini cyclone could have killed me. But, uh, you know, really, uh, a ball, an absolute ball. And that's how I enjoy uh, time away. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. That was an incredibly polished circle. Right on 45 minutes. <laughs> right on 45 minutes. You've been a complete role model for, you know, presentation skills today. So you've also left a nice generous little chunk of time for questions. So I'll throw the floor open. Anybody got a question? Up the back. No. No. I thought it was going to take eight weeks. It took six weeks. Uh, it, I do have a blog, and uh, in that it actually says uh, there was a couple from uh, from Mornington Peninsula. They came up for a weekend and joined me, and that was it, really. They brought their kayaks up for two days, and that was it. Yeah. Feel bad. Sorry. Well, Scott, you started off your talk saying that how torn you were between um, 
image, the success that you had in, in galleries and so on. Um, to quite a few of us, the success is a dream in itself, and, and for us to say, well, I, I want to shift away, and we successfully did so. Um, now, talking about the circles, are you thinking again about now it's time to make some money pieces, for a better word, or for uh, pieces where you can link up this your, yeah. with your network you had established? Yeah, it's good. I uh, probably didn't make that clear enough. It wasn't so, I didn't feel so disheartened with actually making money. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I think it was when uh, I mentioned the uh, collectors coming in out of the bus, you know, and, you know, I think Richard will vouch for this too. There, there was a period there uh, in the early 90s where, due to the dollar being half of the American dollar, there was a lot of collectors that flew over from America knowing they could, it's cheaper for them to actually get a plane, fly over here, hit the tarmac, come to my studio, also buying through the gallery, not straight out of my studio, than it is for them to walk around from their house to the gallery next door, walk around the corner. And uh, These tours were also organised by arts infrastructure, weren't they? They were brought out by some, Craft Australia some, and Yeah, Bosco. or collector guilds. Yes. Collector guilds in America were big at that period. Mm. And uh, my, my, what I really was disheartened by is that they would come in in, and it was, you know, there's the analogy of the shark frenzy. Mm. And that had been used quite a lot because that's how it felt. People would get out of the bus and they would point and I want that one. And what really, that was disheartening because you put, I would only make 20 pieces a year and that's working pretty much every day, uh, weekends included, just at the studio, just kind of mosaic infusing. And then there was a loss rate when I blew them up and everything like that. So let's say about 20 pieces a year, they really do become so personal and so close to you that when someone just comes in and says, that one, without looking at it. I had collectors buy and not even realise that it was a completely different image on the inside. And that was a disappointing thing. You know, that's what kind of like took, I just wanted people to enjoy my work. If they came in and said, hey, look, I really love it and I don't have that much money, I'd bargain it for them. You know, I'd make sure if they really, really want that, I'd, you know, make sure they got it. But it, when they came in, it felt like a horrible analogy. that kind of raping of you. You know, you're just being raped of your goods without the care or without emotion. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's just meat. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Richard, I sorry, I didn't see your hand before. <laughs> I was just going to ask about that sense of um, pilgrimage. I think this is the first time I've seen a, an artist talk for a while because I missed you uh, earlier this year in the classrooms. But I'm really struck by the pilgrimages that you have taken over the last five or seven years or longer. Mm. And I'm interested in that in relationship to how you've approached your living environment and you've, you've reconditioned yourself where you live, say, every four or five years. And also your artwork, how you've always turned it out and, and challenged it and, and, and redeveloped it. Do you see a connection between those? I mean, there's an obvious connection, uh, that sense of renewal, that sense of transformation. Yeah, cleansing. I think, uh, you know, like that phoenix idea, you know, you're coming up from the ashes. And I believe that a pilgrimage like that is, to me, it's, you know, Stephen Proctor. Uh, uh, Stephen Proctor... Uh, would always get his students to read uh, Puello Kelo's The Pilgrim, right? And that was probably my first hearing of, it's based on that pilgrimage. And uh, he would always talk about the journey being more important than the end and that. And I think the beauty about a pilgrimage, or not even, I wouldn't even call it a pilgrimage for me, I would just say it's the walk. And, uh, and for what that is, if you've ever been camping, if you're an avid camper, there's, I, I call it the two-week uh, two wall. And that idea, if you go camping for two weeks, you always have that sense of security. If it's raining or you don't like it, you say, ah, another week, I'm out of here. I'll be back home kind of thing. But when you go on ventures like that, you have to say, there's no time limit. Uh, you, just, you just walk. And you, don't say, I don't, you never book a return ticket. Uh, when I was doing the paddling, I thought it was going to take me eight weeks. It could have taken me ten. Uh, I got into the rhythm and I got, it took me six. I think once you reach that two-week wall, 
everything is forgotten about back home. You know, you can't worry about, oh, did I leave the kettle on? Have I paid those bills? Those kind of things have all annulled. And really what it comes down to is a very primal state, and why I call it a cleansing, is that you have, what's the weather? Where am I going to sleep? What am I eating? And my fucking blisters. <laughs> you know, and they're pretty much the issues that you deal with. And I love that annulment of everything else out there. I never take my... Well, I must admit, on the, on the paddle I took my phone, I made a blog, but it was also for security. Uh, on the walk, um, you can, there's a, somewhere to stop pretty much every, uh, they, what they call an albergue or a, uh, or a refugio. And it's really just a small room attached to a church where you pay about five euros for the night in a snoring, kind of stinking little room. And, um, and you feel secure in that sense. There's always somewhere to get food. And if you are hurt, there'll probably be someone along in an hour to walk, who's walking behind you. But that idea of just forgetting everything else back home yeah, it's the way I like it. And, and yeah, I don't take a sketchbook. I don't take a camera. Uh, I really want to re remove myself from everything. And then I know when I come back, then it's all crazy, and, you know, travel haphazard, making, kind of talking to people about uh, work and everything like that, and trying to run your life again. So I think in a way it's a very important thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, we don't always have that time. You know, sacrifice two months. Yeah, but I'm going down the Mekong next year, if anyone's <laughs> interested. Um, I came back on the paddle, someone, someone asked me, so what are you going to do now? And I said, oh, I don't know, I've never thought of it. And uh, next day paddling, I thought, I've never been to Southeast Asia. I lived in Japan for a year, I've lived France, Germany, England, all of these other places. And uh, I've never been to Southeast Asia. And I thought, okay, I'll go for another paddle, go down the Mekong. My younger brother is right into... He used to go every year to uh, Vietnam and uh, Indonesia, Sulawesi and that. And so I thought we, uh, we went online and saw these uh, long fisherman canoes, uh, quite uh, maybe six, seven metres long with a person at the front and the back. I thought, right, we'll get three of those and six people and go for a paddle. <laughs> uh, that's next year. Yeah. So how was that, you know, the walking, the relationship with time that you have? in the pilgrimage. Has that sort of shaped your relationship with your practice in any kind of way? Uh, I don't see my work as being spiritual one bit. Uh, no, that's uh, not really uh, what no okay. About. <laughs> okay, I want to make that clear though. I'm not into this whole kind of, I, I do it for uh, that idea of removing myself from all the kind of like the commercialization, mm -hmm. the discussions, the rhetoric. All of those things about art that I, I deal with all the time. And I, when I usually, when I get into the studio and I'm by myself, I'm pretty manic. Mm -hmm. And I love repetition, like mm -hmm. cutting, sitting down, cutting those circles, you know, and then knotting them all. It's, it's kind of, you just have to put yourself in a zone and go for that. And I think in one way that kind of does relate to the walk. You know, you just put your pack on and you start at, you start at 5.30 in the morning and you just walk. Yeah. And uh, you just continue until you want to stop, and then it's just, but it's just that repetition. And I do that. I, I, I find meditation in actually knotting all of those little bits of uh, glass together. So I think there is a parallel that way. Yeah. Uh. Any other questions for Scott? Mel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, being so. Mm -hmm. Look, I love blowing glass. Now, I know Brian couldn't make it today, but uh, I was, I've talked a lot of, to Brian Core about this. I love technique, and I love the social side of blowing glass. But I think there's also a trap in it too. You know, there's this idea that uh, the technique is driving the, the 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 creativity, and I don't know if that's right. For some people, it might work, but for me, I fight against that all the time, and I have to push that you know, that social side of going into the hot shop, which I do love so much. And, I know, and I've come in here and blown a couple of times, and I know the students go, oh, you can blow glass. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, yeah, it's one of those things. You, I'm sure there's a lot of people that kind of used to ride horses or something and will ride 
ride uh, bicycles a lot or something, I don't know. But, and then you get to a certain point and you say, I used to surf a lot and you know, I now live in Canberra because of what I, you know, the, uh, the friends and the social group, but also the, um, the infrastructure for glass around here too is important than me kind of like just doing social things of going for a surf every afternoon. Yeah, priorities. Hate it. Hate it. Responsibilities and commitments. Okay, if there are no more questions for Scott, we're only one last opportunity to put your hand up. And if there aren't any, then we get 